I am going to read to you a slash line, and you have to guess who it is. The slash line is 282, 321, 459 for a 780 OPS. That's in 224 plate appearances, so a little over a third of a season's worth, I would say. Eight home runs for this individual. 118 WRC+. Plus. For a reminder, that is 18% better than league average at 100 for weighted runs created and adjusted for park factor and, and league average, like I said. And this person has accumulated one Fangraphs war so far in in the young season. Uh, young season? It's almost July. Who do you think that is? You are correct. It's Jared Kelnick, former Mariner Jared Kelnick, and now... I started this episode off with violence. I understand that. And I just want to compare that to uh, the four Mariners main outfielders they've had this year. The 118 WRC plus would be first among these outfielders. Luke Rayleigh has compiled a 114 Dominic Canzone, a 111. And then you get to the low uh, below league average fellas and Julio Rodriguez with an 89 and Mitch Hanniger with a very, very stinky 79. 89 is not that much better to be quite honest with you. Julio has the same amount of war, but that's, you know, he plays great center field defense and steals bases. Luke Rayleigh has 0.8 Fangraphs war, Dom Canzone 0.5, and Mitch Hanniger negative 0.9. He's been terrible in the field and at the plate, like, catastrophically bad in the field. Uh, the eight home runs would be second on this list. Luke Rayleigh has nine, Canzone has seven, Julio has seven, Mitch has six. And all this to say... Nothing, really. I just wanted to say that. Uh, and now, if the real Chaos Ball podcast heads are still listening, which I know you are, I think uh, some probably jump ship right after they heard Jared Kelnick and heard those statistics. So I commend you. Yeah, you. I'm talking to you, the listener, for holding on. Uh, I, I don't have a whole lot else to say about this. He just had, he's been having a really good June, Jared Kalanick, that is. Uh, and I hearken back to what I said when this trade happened. Similar to the Eugenio trade, but that one looks more kind of like a, a, a lose-lose for both teams because Eugenio hasn't been that good. Manor's third base production has been surprisingly solid. Uh, but like Carlos Vargas has not been amazing in AAA, and obviously Sevi Savali got DFA. So that one's just kind of a wash. The Jared Kelnick, Evan White, Marco Gonzalez trade for who was it? Cole Phillips and uh, Jackson Cower both are hurt. It's not to say Jackson Cower and Cole Phillips won't contribute to the Mariners as early as next season. Maybe they will. Maybe they never will contribute to the big league team at all. I was never the big Jerry Kelnick, a big Jerry Kelnick fan. As you know, if you've listened to the show for any amount of time, I'm a fairly realistic baseball fan. And uh, even when it comes to my Mariners, I was hoping, hoping, hoping like everyone else he put together. But openly on this podcast and on the Internet, I was very, I don't want to say anti Jerry Kelnick, but just like I never thought he was going to be a good player. But even when that trade happened, I was against it because trading useful players in Kelnick was a useful player at the very least on a team with very little corner outfield production. He was a useful player. Trading him in a salary dump is just so lame. It's just such a bad way to run a baseball team. And I don't know if it's on Jerry DePoto. He probably just had to wriggle around with the budget that he was given. And maybe it's not entirely his fault that he had to trade because he got rid of the Evan White and Marco Gonzalez contracts, which grand scheme, they're not that big at all for a serious baseball team. But the Mariners are not a serious baseball team in the way they conduct business, at least. But he's been he's been having a great June and just a solid year overall. Like those numbers are solid. A 78, 780 OPS in the year 2024 is great. I think the league average OPS right now is like six. 70 or something 680 usually it's more around 700 but offense is down but Jared Kelnick I mean he just went like six for nine and a double header the other day he's just been having a great year and it would be first among Mariners outfielders in most categories and you know maybe if they kept Jared Kelnick they wouldn't have even had Luke Rayleigh because that trade came after uh Jared Kelnick doesn't fully address like needing the right-handed outfielder but he, you know then if you had Kelnick, you could you could DH him or Canzone, 
versus righties and have Garver just kind of mash against lefties like he should, you just have another useful player on your team. And I was worried about this. I was worried that Jerry Kelnick would have, like, not an amazing season, but just, like, a good season. And the Mariners could use a good offensive season. And they're getting it. I mean, Luke Rayleigh and Dom Canzone have been have been solid, I will say. But just uh, get trading, again, trading useful players in the salary dump. It's just such an unserious way to conduct business. But that's how I'm kicking off this show. Welcome back to the Chaos Ball Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'm not going to read off Teoscar Hernandez's numbers this episode. I think everyone's aware of what he's been up to. I was also a fan of qualifying offering him, which I don't think the Mariners did. Uh, but this is this is the show. Uh, I have plenty of, of vamping to get up to full transparency. I was quite busy this weekend uh, at my brother's wedding, officiating my brother's wedding. Actually, shout out Sean if you're listening. Happy marriage. Uh, but so I didn't really watch much ball until Tuesday and Wednesday. So the past two days, I've watched the highlights of the weekend, and boy, there's just not there's not much to there's not much to talk about. They dropped the series to the Marlins, and do I want to talk about it in depth? Not really, but I, I will a little bit. But for just the outlook of this show, uh, I did want to touch on the outfield production and Jared Kelnick, as I just did, and then I'm going to probably talk a little bit about Brian Wu. Uh, talk a little bit about the bullpen, talk a little bit about the back end of the rotation at the moment, maybe talk about a Hogan Windish four home run game potentially, and then probably just vamp a little bit to end the show. But thanks for listening and strap in because I'm, I'm ranting about pitching today. That's what I'm doing. Uh, and then I might, I might, if time permits, take a look at some just overall offensive numbers for the team and rant a little bit about if this core is actually a good enough championship winning core could be a hot take okay i just paused before getting into the rest of the show and i need to issue a correction i said the league ops was way lower than it actually is the league average ops is 704 so still quite quite down last year was 734 uh, and, you know, we're getting still to, I guess, the warmer summer baseball season, but um, I'm sure it'll take up a little bit, maybe from 704, but you get my point. Very hard environment, and Jericho on like 780 OPS is a good one. But let's get to the rest of the show, and let's just start off with more violence uh, before I really talk about uh, the pitching situation currently and, and what's going up with what's going on with the offense. The Astros are at 500 currently as I record this. They're 40 and 40, four and a half games back of the Seattle Mariners. If you recall, it was only last week. The Mariners were uh, 10 games up in the division, and they're now four and a half back. Mariners are 46 and 37. They're four and six in their last 10. The Astros are eight and two in their last 10. They're on a seven-game win streak currently. Uh, their offensive pieces of Tucker, Jordan, Altuve have been fuego recently and the pitching has been much much better uh than recently their pitching has gotten better each month over the year uh large part just the work they've done with like spencer arigetti but especially hunter brown has been really good for them uh i mentioned last week i was very scared i was very scared to be that far up in the division and i know this manager team is not 10 games better than even the rangers and the, and the astros for sure like just Purely based on run differential, I was not super confident that the Mariners were that good, but also the Astros and Rangers just kept being bad, so I was like, okay. But I, I, if you recall, I was quite scared at that large division league because there was literally only – they could only lose, really. I mean, either they go on and win the division by double-digit games or they – or this happens, and the Astros are, are looming four and a half back is not ideal, especially after just a tough road trip. You drop a series to the Marlins, one you should have won, and you're kind of in a skid. You didn't get swept by the Rays, but you almost got swept by the Rays. You got close, and now you find yourself almost like a four-game series away from, from not being in first anymore where you have been for so long now. Uh, thankfully, they did get the win yesterday. Uh, off the backs to J.P. Crawford and Big Dumper himself. And just a great start from George Joseph Kirby, who's been so good since a little 
his little sh- scuffle in April, I'd say, but he's been so good since then. Um, but I just wanted to let you all know I'm still scared. I'm very scared of the Astros. I will never not be scared of the Astros until uh, the season is over. Until the division has been won or lost, I will not. I just will never rest. I will be thinking about the Astros at all at all times. And I don't think they're going to be a seller. There was talk if they kept doing this, like Cal Tucker, they'd ship out and some other guys. But no, they're 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 going to be a buyer for sure. There's no reason for them to sell at all. Uh, and yeah, that is uh, frightening. So the Rangers are 37 and 43. They still haven't looked great. Really, their offense hasn't looked great. Uh, they've only scored 13 more runs than the Mariners this season overall offensively. Uh, their pitching has been honestly about as expected, especially though the injuries they started with. It's their offense that's failed them this year. The, their bread and butter last year. They had one of the best offenses and not the best offense in baseball for a lot of the year. And this year, just a lot of guys have just not, it's not, there weren't a lot of steps forward for a lot of the guys to take. The older guys, especially just felt like that was probably as good as they're going to get, but quite a few of them have dropped off more than expected to. Uh, And like Seager was hurt. Uh, The things aren't going amazing over there in Arlington as they host the all-star game this year, but things are going great in Houston. So that's unfortunate. But I will, I will move on to the pitching. I'm going to talk about the bullpen a little bit, but before that, Brian Wu is on the 15-day IL. He's on the IL officially again after what feel like what feels like what two months of he was rehabbing and then he was back on a pitch count limit and then he was skipped a start. Then he was on two starts with a pitch count limit and then he skipped another start and then he pitched like 64 pitches I think in his last outing before the recent one and it was like oh is he hurt again but no he was actually fine and then he comes out in his most recent start he pitches a couple innings and then bam hamstring hamstring injury so brutal for him because it wasn't even an arm it wasn't an arm thing if it was elbow soreness, whatever, I'd be like, okay, put him on the eye. Like, it makes sense with everything that's been going on with his his elbow and his and his forearm this year. Uh, but no, this is a hamstring strain, basically. He tried to throw another pitch on the mound with everyone watching and did not go well. He's on the 15-day IL, which honestly might be best. It's going to rest his arm and his hamstring, but I guess now after he comes back, they're going to have to try to ramp him up again. And the entire season, they've been trying to ramp him up. Like, has he thrown more than 80 pitches in a start all year? I don't think he has. And I could fact check that, but I'm not going to. I think we need to have a serious conversation about him moving to the bullpen. I, for the team's sake and for his arm's sake, I just, I talked about it last week, how... How good or bad is it that he is on a pitch count every week? He's been damn good when he's pitched in his limited innings this year. He's been so good. But it's tough for a team that (laughs) doesn't have, like, the deepest middle relief pen at the moment to have a guy be on a pitch count every week or every five days, like, especially now he's going to come back. I don't know what they're going to do with him. I think a serious conversation is going to need to be had about him moving to the bullpen for the rest of the year, because then he can throw less overall. They can manage his innings a lot easier out of the pen. He's throwing less pitches per start. It seemed like when he first came back and he had just kind of elbow tightness, it seemed like he basically, it was like the fourth or fifth inning every time he'd, he'd have that elbow tightness. Uh, and it's, you know, moving to the bull, moving him to the bullpen would prevent him from throwing 50 plus pitches in an outing. They could really limit him to one inning at a time. They could be like, okay, he's, he's not going to pitch on back to back days. They could even not have him pitch. They could have him two days between pitches and limit his outings to 30, 35 pitches an inning or two each each bullpen sash and integrate him that way and that could be best for his arm maybe it's unavoidable that he just has a season-ending arm injury knock on wood um, 
I really hope not, but it just might. I just don't know if you can really have a fifth starter who's constantly on a pitch count when you're trying to win every game that you possibly can and get the most out of every one of these starters because you need the most out of every one of these starters to win baseball games with the pitiful offense they've built. So it would also address a need in the bullpen of just an extra bullpen arm, a somewhat long guy, but just another bullpen arm because I'll transition right now to the bullpen. This bullpen desperately needs, they need Gregory Santos back, first of all, and there's good signs from him. He threw live BP a few days ago, and there was a Seattle Times article that was like everyone was wowed by what they saw. I mean, I think we've all forgotten the Gregory Santos hype because he's been hurt for so long. He was so good last year, and his stuff is absolutely electric, and he comes into a Mariners pitching infrastructure that can clearly get, usually get the most out of guys, especially bullpen arms. They know what they're doing, and you come in with a guy with electric stuff like that who can control it on on most days, and you just, obviously, we should assume that he's going to be good when he's on the mound. It's all about him being on the mound. So he is slowly coming back, which is really good. The team really needs it. And then there's like the Logan Evans impending call up. They've moved him to the bullpen in Arkansas to get him in a rhythm um, to be in a professional bullpen. The confidence levels for me are still the same. And Andres Munoz, he's just been a little banged up health wise. There's been no catastrophic injury, but he's just been kind of dinged up here and there. Um, core back oblique like that stuff is just screams overuse to me. And they can't overuse him right now. They need to use him an appropriate amount. And he's definitely won them some games this season. And that's been huge for obviously winning baseball games. But they're going to need to lean on him a lot in September and October, especially if if the division race is going to be close like we all expect it to be. And if they end up actually making the playoffs, obviously you, you lean on a guy like Andres Munoz a lot more at that time. And they need him then. They can't overuse him now. So it's not even about limiting pitching outings for guys like Bizarro and Cody Bolton even. And it's more about preserving Andres Munoz. So I don't know what they do with Brian. Because if they move Brian Wu to the bullpen and they get Gregory Santos back, then it does get a little crowded for Logan Evans. My question is, do they make a big time pivot and say, Hey, Logan Evans, maybe we want you to actually be the fifth starter, or we're going to try to have you be the fifth starter. Or maybe they bring Logan Evans up technically in the bullpen and they piggyback him off of Wu on his starts. So they give Wu four or five innings. They give him a 75 pitch counter or whatever they're going to do. And they say, Evans, you're going in there for two to three innings out of the pen to get us through to the seventh or eighth inning to then we can go to a higher leverage guy and Munoz and Stanek and Saucedo Thornton, whatever, whatever. Maybe they do that. I'm not sure. They have a lot of options, but I don't know. I don't know if they trade for a bullpen arm at this point because they see if you move Brian Wu to the bullpen – Logan Evans, Gregory Santos come back. Then you have a pretty sick bullpen. And then maybe, you know, with you throw in Chris, Chris Flexen and with Luis Robert in a little trade package, and Chris Flexen is now your innings eater five with a great bullpen. It's almost, especially getting down to the nitty gritty in September and October, and especially if you make the playoffs. Teams don't go five deep in the playoff. Teams barely go four deep in the playoffs. And Mariners would probably go three and then figure it out. I don't know if Brian, I don't know if Bryce Miller would start a game before the championship series. To be honest, they lean heavily on those top three and then pitch guys out of the bullpen for the rest of it. So I don't know. They have a lot of stuff they could do. The bullpen, I think, will be fine, but it's definitely... A, somewhat of a shaky situation with the amount of innings they've had to throw recently. But thank God for George Kirby. And at least when Luis Castillo, even if Luis Castillo doesn't have a great game, he goes somewhat deep in the games. 
But yeah, I don't know. I, Brian Wu also would just make sense in the bullpen for me. His, 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 his secondary stuff is definitely coming along, but his fastball is so damn good, and he leans on it heavily, as he should. It's a really, really good fastball. It's an, a, a, basically an elite fastball shape, and he uses it really well and can locate it. And so that translates pretty well to the bullpen for me. But I don't know if they're going to do that yet. I'm sure they'll try to ramp him up again to fill that five hole. But it's just getting to, like, I don't know, time. I think we're going to see Emerson Hancock again probably fill in in the five spot. And I'm not opposed to that. I think he's perfectly fine. I don't think he's an amazing pitcher, but I feel like he's a fine guy to have in AAA just in case. Um, Weirdly, people on Twitter were, like, angry that the Mariners traded Dallas Keuchel to the Brewers for cash considerations. Why would why why were people angry about trading Dallas Keuchel in the year 2024? It's like, oh man, he could have been the fifth starter. No, I love Emerson Hancock every day of the week than Dallas Keuchel on the fifth spot. I would have a bullpen day. Austin Voth is an opener over Dallas Keuchel in the five spot in the year 2024. He's got roughed up in that start he made for the Brewers. Like I don't know why people were mad about that. Um, but the bullpen overall, my feelings, again, Andres Munoz's confidence levels are high. He's been awesome. I worry about overuse, but that's about it. Taylor Salcedo, on the whole, has been really, really good this year. I think we know what we're going to get from him. He is used, and he's kind of like a Swiss Army knife. He's not a lefty specialist. I know they'd probably like to have him pitch against more lefties, but his funky release and his like sinker, it works against righties and lefties. Uh, and he's he pitches high leverage, low leverage. He I feel like he's the bases loaded guy sometimes, which is really interesting just because he can get a ground ball a lot more than um, some other guys in the bullpen. Like he has the highest ground ball percentage of anyone in the bullpen who's qualified. Like Bizarro is higher than him technically, but with less innings. And I think the other guy I'm increasingly more confident in the other two is is Trent Thornton and Ryan Stanick. Those are the two next guys with the best ERAs in the pen. Trent Thornton with a 3.22 and 2.88 FIP. And then Stanek with a 3.45 ERA with a 2.93 FIP. And I'm okay with those guys being higher leverage inning guys. But I think Andres Munoz and Gregory Santos as the two stopper high leverage guys with Trent Thornton and Ryan Stanek following them is great. I think that's a good situation with Taylor Saucedo and then ideally whenever Gabe Spire is back, Gabe Spire as your lefties. Uh, Mike Bauman has not been great. He has not had a good time with the Seattle Mariners. He has a 5 8 4 ERA in the 12 innings pitch with the M so far after the trade. A 6.16 FIP, which is really bad. His X FIP is way lower than that. Um, and I am, as I've noted on this podcast, I'm a big Sierra guy skill interactive ERA for bullpen pitchers especially and his skill interactive ERA is 3.28 I don't think Mike Bauman is a DFA candidate or a send down candidate yet his ERA looks bad I think as a middle reliever he's fine I just don't know if we're gonna I I don't think they can lean on him for high leverage and then Bizarro has just been really bad Bizarro I made a tweet about last year towards the end of the season like I think he's gonna play a big part in the bullpen in 2024 and I made that take purely on aesthetics because I like watching him pitch. I like his delivery. I like his pitches overall and his aesthetics. I, it's just not It's just not a good thing to rely on. Um, and that's that's the bullpen. I mean, Kirby Snead is on this list that I'm looking at of pitchers who've pitched in this bullpen um, this year, but he's down in AAA, and I don't know if he's going to be back up, barring injuries. Austin Voth has been good. Austin Voth has honestly been better than I expected as the long guy. Uh, his FIP is a decent amount higher than his ERA, but uh, I think just as the long guy out of the pen, he's fine. And maybe, listen, maybe Ryan Wu or Logan Evans can fill that spot and do even better than both. But both has been serviceable for certain. Uh, and the last thing I'll say about the bullpen, I forgot to say this about Mike Bauman. His home run per nine is 2.92, which is insanely high. Even if Even if you're a terrible pitcher, like you're not going to run that all year. Like, that is absurd. I think that's part of the reason why his ex-FIP is so much lower than his actual FIP, uh, because I think league average home run per nine is 
probably like one ish i'd imagine and 2.92 is unsustainable it's going to come down and it's funny too because this bab the babip is 207 which makes sense because um uh home runs are not bad at balls so the he hasn't been giving up a lot of hits but a lot of home runs that's for sure uh his other numbers are, are very fine so I, I think as a as a middle reliever, lower lever, I think Mike Bauman is perfectly fine in this pen. Uh, but that's my thoughts on the bullpen. I'm just, I don't know how they proceed. Maybe they move for a start at the deadline again, like an innings year, like I mentioned last week. We'll see what they do with Brian Wu. Just suck. He's back on the IL. But and it is what it is. Now on to the offense. What's the problem? I think we've gotten a big enough sample. We're almost to July. I think I've gotten a big enough sample to make some informed takes here about the offense. And obviously, no, the offense isn't isn't good. I'll say that. I know. I know. It's crazy to say that, but it's not good. And I could I could really delve deep into the Statcast data to find some reasons why or like reasons why they could be better than they are. And I, I did that like a month and a half ago with their hard hit rate and their total balls in play and their strikeout percentage and stuff like that. Uh, but no, you don't need to look far to just know this offense isn't good. It, their runs per game is 3.9. That is fifth worst in the league. The teams below them are the White Sox, who are averaging a three runs per game, which is impressively bad. The Marlins, who they just dropped the series to, the Oakland Athletics and the Toronto Blue Jays, who are tied with the Mariners at 3.9 runs per game, that is just really bad. And they're allowing 3.8 runs per game. It's the only team in the bottom 12 of the league that has a positive like run differential per game. Every other team in the bottom 12 of the league has a negative run differential per game, but not the Mariners. runs per game is their differential because their pitching has just been that good. Like their pitching is 3.8 runs allowed per game. That's seventh overall in the league. And that that's, that's a great pitching staff. You have uh, really good pitching staffs above them and you're tied with three other teams. It's the Phillies in first and the Dodgers in second, the guardians in third. And then uh, four teams, including the Mariners are tied at 3.8 runs per game. The Orioles, the Yankees, the Braves and the Mariners. So the offense isn't good. It's just not good. Um, And we knew this. Uh, We knew the offense wasn't going to be great this year, but it's being not good in ways I did not anticipate. The best hitters on this team currently, if I just go by WRC+, Luke Rayleigh, number one with 114 WRC+. Dylan Moore, number two. With 112 WRC plus, that speaks to how scorching he was in the month of May because he has not been good recently. Um, ticked up, ticked up recently last week, thankfully. But Dylan Moore, overall great year for him. Three, Dominic Canzone, 111 WRC plus. Of the guys who've played the most games this year, your top three hitters, qualified hitters, are Rayleigh Moore and Canzone. I really did not have that on my bingo card for 2024 for the Seattle Mariners. In fourth place with just 22 games played is Ryan Bliss, who's been who's had a great week. Team did not have a good week. He had a great week. He was really the biggest bright spot of the highlights that I watched from the Marlins series. Because uh, reminder, I did not watch that series, but Ryan Bliss was doing a lot of good things, and he has been. And he offers a lot of speed, and his defense at second base has looked great so far. Shout out to Perry Hill. So I feel like he's, he's making a case to stay on this team permanently, um, which Tyler Locklear has not, which I won't talk about. I don't have much to say. They sent him down. What are you going to do? I Whatever. I talked about what they could do last week, and then they just sent him down. I didn't anticipate that. I thought uh, I thought Robles was just getting DFA'd when he came back, but I guess not. Um, and that might be coming because Ryan Bliss has apparently been working out in like left field. So it could be if Tyler Locklear absolutely tears up triple a in the next couple weeks and Robles continues to be Victor Robles, which no offense to him. He seems like a really awesome dude. I just don't think he's really should belong on a contending big league roster. Maybe Ryan Bliss is, is a Dylan Morey type where maybe second base left field, he can play third, I think. Yeah, he's he's 
giving them reasons to keep him on this team. And then after this, Ty France with a 109 WRC plus, Josh Rojas with a 104 WRC plus, who's also playing Gold Glove caliber defense at third base. It's a Eugenio type situation over there. Perry Hill again, dog. You're a god. Uh, JP Crawford with a 103 WRC plus, which is astounding given his start. His start was so poor, and it's a testament to how uh, how much power he's been running into since he got back. And he continues to walk. He can. That's not anything that's left his game, which is really nice. And that is where the above average hitters stop in terms of WRC plus. I'll read it again. I'm gonna leave out Bliss because he's not. He's only he's played less than half the games with all the other guys. But you got Luke Rayleigh, Dylan Moore, Dominic Canzone, Ty France, Josh Rojas, and JP Crawford. And your best hitter topping out at 114 WRC plus is not very good. That's fine. That's great for Luke Rayleigh. But that's not <laughs> that's not what you want from your best offensive player on the team. And now we get to the below average. And I'm going to leave off Luis Urias on here. He's in AAA. But it reads Cal Raleigh with a 99 WRC plus, so basically bang average. He is almost Lee. He's he's him and Luke Rayleigh both have the same strikeout rate at 31.3 percent, which is not good. Uh, but Cal has 14 home runs, and he's also walking 10 percent of the time. But still, 99 WRC plus. Just really, he's hitting 204. Just hasn't been hasn't been getting into as many extra base hits and singles as one might want. But 14 home runs is, is good. And, you know, he's playing great catcher defense. We That's fine. If he hits 30 bombs with a 104 WRC plus and great defense, we'll still take that all day. Mitch Garver is next on the list with 95 WRC plus. Another testament to how hot he's been in June. He's been the Mariners' best hitter in June. Such a slow start, but has really ticked up recently, which has been very helpful. I hope that continues. And then Julio Rodriguez with an 89, as I, I mentioned before, with – when I was talking about Jared Kelnick, it's just been not good. It just has not been good. And I think I might really do a statistical deep dive on him next week, potentially. It's just, you don't have, to, again, you don't have to look far. At, you can just look at these raw numbers, and it's just not good. It's not what you want at all. He is 23 years old, and it's a testament to what he's done the past couple of years that we have such high expectations for him. I mean, he is and should be the Mariners' best player and best hitter overall, like bar none. They, he should be the best. He should be atop this WRC Plus leaderboard, 130 plus. He's at 89 right now. He's shown, like, the power is still in there. He's stealing a lot of bags. He's still playing great center field. But, man, the hitting has just been bad. He's played every uh, damn near – I think he's played every game, too. Like, he's just he's posting, which is also important for your superstar. But just – he has the lowest isolated power on the team. It's 84, which is bad if you don't know what isolated power is. And it's not like he's getting unlucky with bad at balls. Bad at balls – bad at Babip is 336 because he's still hitting the ball pretty hard when he puts it in play. He's just not hitting home runs, and he's not really hitting that many extra base hits. It's just not – he needs to be better for this team to to really be a good offense. And then below him is Mitch Hanniger at 79, WRC+, plus, and Jorge Polanco at 73. And that in there lies the problem with the offense. Luke really doing more, Dominic Canzone, even – we'll throw Ryan Bliss, Josh Rojas. All of those guys having a positive WRC+, plus is amazing. If you told me – that at the start of the season they had these kind of numbers, I would assume the Mariners are a top 15 offense at least. But no, they're a bottom 10 at least, realistically bottom 5. In terms of run score, they're they're bottom 5. It's not good. Ryan Bliss, cool. That's great. We love this. But they need more. Like Ty France with a 109 WRC plus. Man, that's sure. That's That's... Taken up from last year, but that's still not what you want from your first baseman who is particularly bad on defense. That is just not the offensive production you need from your first baseman. And he's been better of late. It's been inc- more encouraging, but still a first baseman that's super limited and needs to overcompensate with really hitting well. Um, and then you have J.P. Crawford, Cal Raleigh, Julio Rodriguez, and I'll throw Mitch Garver and Jorge Polanco in there. 
because before the season, that was basically like, hey, that's the offensive core of the team. And those guys have simply not been good. Again, I could dig into to data. I could I could go very nitty gritty on what the problems are with each player, but you don't need to do that right now when you look at these numbers and it's just like those are the guys that need to be better. So at the trade deadline, there's really no position that can't be upgraded, which is a good and bad thing because they could back into mediocrity as they've done at the past couple deadlines. They traded for Luis Castillo, which was great, but like offensively, they could see this like, well, all of our role players are doing great and we expect Julio and Jorge Polanco and JP and Cal to be better than this. So we don't need to really go all, all out, but they do, they should. And they do. Um, it's just tough. It's tough in a sea of mediocrity to, to make these decisions, but even like Ty France with a one Oh nine WRC plus, if there's an opportunity to get Vladdy, the upside that he offers, I would take a million percent over Ty France. Even if he ends up putting up the same production as Ty France the rest of the season, I would take the swing 10 times out of 10 because the upside is a guy who can anchor your offense, and you don't have an anchor right now. Ideally, it's Julio, and he hasn't been like that. He just hasn't been good at the plate. A Luis Robert, who can play center where you might not need him, he can play in the corners. You could DH him a little bit to try to preserve his health. Sure. Those guys, those are the type of guys they need to take a swing on because this offense just needs better bats. And I don't know if they're going to replace Polanco. They're not going to replace Julio. They're not going to replace Cal or JP. It's like Ty France. And I think the obvious one is Mitch Hanniger. The obvious one is getting a better right-handed hitting outfielder, i.e. Luis Robert Jr., Lou Bob. Make Lou Bob a Mariner. I think it's the most obvious trade that DePoto has ever had to make in his tenure here is trading for Luis Robert. There's other right-handed hitting outfielders that are available. Brent Rooker. I would enjoy Brent Rooker on the Mariners, but he's not Luis Robert. Again, it's the upside that he offers here. If he if if he gets traded here and he gets hurt for the rest of the season, I still obviously in high if they if you told me that before I was going to trade for him, I'd say no, but you don't know that. You can't just say, "Oh, he might get hurt." No, you have to take swings. This elite staff that they have, at least their front 3 is a World Series contending front three of a rotation and you have an electric back of the bullpen guy with a bunch of pretty solid arms surrounding him. You potentially have a superstar bat in Julio that we've seen him go from zero to a hundred really quick. And that could feasibly happen at any time, but you just need more, but it's not going to be the fix all they trade for Luis Robert and he's amazing with all of these other numbers from these guys, it still wouldn't be an amazing offense. They need Polanco and Julio and Garver and Cal and JP to just be a little bit better than this. Julio and Polanco especially. Polanco the most because it's been so bad with Jorge Polanco, man. It's been terrible. So it's... Like, what do they do at the deadline? They need to both be aggressive, and also the guys at home just need to start performing well. It's both. It's simply both. And it's not that complicated. Uh, And at a time when they have completely restocked the farm, you have the capital to get a Luis Robert, to get a Vlad Jr., to get a Brent Rooker even, you know? They have the prospect capital to do it, and they should not sit on all of these prospects. They need to ship some of them out for big league talent because they just just they can't waste the great pieces that they have currently on this team. And they've also advertised to the fans that they're in it. They advertised that last season. They said, we're here, we're going to be aggressive, and then they sold at the trade deadline and missed the playoffs. It's just, it's, 
this is probably the most crucial next month of, of the front office of Jerry DePoto and Justin Hollander's reign since they've had here. I think it's the most pivotal make or break moment and to see what they do. Same with John Stanton. Same with John Stanton. We know he sucks, but this is the moment to add salary as well because you just can't add you can't add good players without adding salary. And part of that might just be eating Mitch Haniger's salary and saying goodbye to him as hard as that might be. It might be a release and eat his salary because I don't know if you're going to be able to trade that guy right now. That's also part of this is they're going to have to be okay with with wasting some of this salary and even just getting rid of like a guy like Ty France who you have really wanted to be on your team and be a key contributor for a long time and he was for a couple of years, but it's they're going to have to make some of these really tough decisions. Even even moving away from Jorge Polanco could be a move if he continues with a sub 80 wrc plus through the trade deadline i think you heavily need to consider doing something about that maybe just ryan bliss is the full-time second baseman now i they just they need to be aggressive and i think lou it's lou bob lou bob is my number one priority i need him to be a mariner i need it so bad and maybe even they can they throw three of their top 100 prospects and maybe another fringe guy like Michael Arroyo at Lou Bob and uh, Eric Fetty. And then you, there you go. You basically, you have your number four starter because he's been better than Bryce Miller this year. You have your four starter and you have your Lou Bob in the outfield Uh, and you get rid of half of your top 100 prospects, but who cares? You're trying to win now. You're trying to win now. It's just, uh, it's going to be crucial. This next month is going to be huge. It's going to be huge. But ultimately, again, Julio needs to be better. Jorge Blanco needs to be better. Cal needs to be a little bit better at the plate. Garver has been great in June, so I'm not going to rag on him. But the contributions from the guys at the top, like Rayleigh and Canzone in the corners, have been awesome. And... Ryan Bliss has looked fun and great, and Dylan Moore is having a phenomenal season. And Josh Rojas, too. If Josh Rojas is above average offensively with that defense at third base, that is so much better than I thought they were going to get out of third base this season. And Luis Urias is in AAA. So we'll see where they go. We'll see where they go from here. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop talking. I could go on and on. But before I get out of here, and I'm going to end in a second, Hogan Windish, I mentioned at the top of the show, he hit four home runs last, not last night, I think two nights ago. And that is insane. I don't even have much else to say about it. He's on the AA Arkansas Travelers. I think I've mentioned him in some prospect pods that I have done. He's been in the system since 2022, and he's been kind of an intriguing guy. He, he's played second base, a little bit of first base. And he's just been a great player since he's gotten into the Mariners system. Uh, he's posted really good numbers in the complex, in A ball, in high A, and now in double A this season, he's having another good year. And four home runs in a game is insane. At any level, high school even is insane. Four home runs, four for four with four home runs is something you never forget. And I just wanted to shout it out here. It was absolutely crazy. And the name Hogan Windish might be the best name in the Mariners system. Like Lazaro Montez is pretty sweet. Colt Emerson definitely has its charm and like Reed Van Scooter's fun, but Hogan Windish just really rolls off the tongue. Nice. Doesn't it? But shout out to him and shout out to the minor leagues. They have, they have plenty of talent down there. Top 100 and, and next 100 to go and improve the team. So go do it, Jerry. Uh, but the outlook Going into this week is a is a tough one on the schedule, but it's good. They have a homestand after a road trip to Cleveland, to Florida, Miami, and St. Petersburg. They now have the Twins for a three-game series at home, and the Twins have been playing good ball. Uh, then they have the Orioles at home. Orioles have been playing good ball all year. That's going to be a tough one, but... It's in Seattle, so maybe that'll neutralize a little bit of their offense with the pitching staff. And one of them is Bark at the Park night. Bark at the Park on July 2nd against the Orioles is going to be a very tough test for the Mariners who have not lost a Bark in the Park night this year at home or away. They have won every Bark in the Park they've played at, and so that's going to be a pivotal game. 
Uh, and then I'll probably record another pod on next Thursday to release on Friday, as I usually do. Uh, but they have the Blue Jays to finish off that homestand, which the Blue Jays have been quite disappointing this year, but that's still not a bad team. That's still a solid team. And maybe you just, that series, you just capture Vladdy in a big net and say, hey, you're, you cannot go back to Canada, sir. You were staying in Seattle. Uh, we'll give you a prospect. Here you go. And that's what you should do. So, And then uh, I'm excited because they're coming down to uh, Angel Stadium the following week and San Diego. Uh, and then the All-Star break happens. And I will be seeing probably three of the four games against uh, the Angels down here in Southern California, which I'm very excited about. Haven't seen any live Mariners baseball at all this year. And I hope they're playing good ball by them. But this is a big week. The Astros are four and a half back. Six games in a row against the Twins and the Orioles is really tough, but it's it's pivotal right now for this team. So we'll see what they can do. But that's it for this pod. Thanks for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your week. And, of course, go Mariners.